Amen. 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 It's quite a paradox, isn't it? To go from not being satisfied in life, not understanding or knowing contentment, to come to Christ and find life and to find it in abundance, to find contentment, to find satisfaction, and yet at the same time, wanting more of Him. That's the paradox. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Please remember that. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Then he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Here's the, the part of knowing him and yet wanting to know him more. Not that I've already attained or attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on. That Holy Spirit inspired and enabled, enabling to want to know more and to press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And we could say amen and go home, but we won't. Please turn to Luke chapter 18. Just some extra food for thought. <clears throat> and it's the best food I know. That's why Job said, no, it wasn't. Job didn't say it because it's the best food I know, but I agree with Job, who says, I esteem his word more than my necessary food. Luke chapter 18, as we continue on in Luke's gospel and in this chapter today, we'll be reading verses 18 through 30. Uh, it started dawning on me. I don't know if I'm going to get through all these verses today. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. So all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left all. We've left all of our own. And followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. Which tells us that the eternal life is twofold. We come to saving knowledge of Christ. We come to know eternal life, but it's only in part in this life. The fullness of it is yet to come. That's why I say the best is yet to come. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. 
I am grateful for uh, another day, grateful for strength, and, and uh, thank you for a desire to want to desire you. Thank you for a desire to want to make big of Jesus today. I thank you for this time of corporate worship. I, I, I love it. I am I am just grateful to be amongst the family of God, at least a small part of it. Um, thankful for the time to sing together, to pray together, to look to your word together. Father, I, I pray, I, I pray, blessed Spirit of God, you're the author of this word. And so please bring understanding. Uh, please make it clear. And Father, I pray that your spirit will use it for the calling and the drawing of those who are outside the kingdom. You, by your grace, would reveal to them their sinfulness and their need for Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would speak to the religious today who are relying on their own righteousness, who are part of the lost, part of those outside the kingdom, that they would see their erring way by your spirit and your word. And Father, for those who know Christ, for those of us who have, by your grace, our eyes have been opened to your truth, your goodness has led us to repentance, your, your word has brought us to a godly sorrow and have moved us to cry out to you. Your grace, your grace alone has saved us. And so help us to want you more, to desire you more to live for you more, continue to refine us, uh, putting us through the crucibles of life, God, that, uh, that the dross and, the, and the, all the things that keep us from a wholeheartedness to you, Lord, that you would, you would uh, rid us of those things that we'd be totally uh, for you and for your glory and your honor and your kingdom. May your word find its marks today. We ask you and thank this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said earlier, the, the title, I was struggling with trying to come up with a title. Uh, and you could look at that and say, yeah, it looks, it appears that way. But uh, if I was to put a new one on it today, I think I would put the most important question ever, right? The most important question ever. Because this is what I find the, the ruler asking Jesus is the most important question ever. Uh, let, let's just go right to it. We've got a, many verses to cover today. So, Eric, we're going to have the first set up there, verses 18 and 19. Now, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit, the, to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. Well, there is much to unpack here. There really is. And if you're one to take notes, and if not, if it's just metal no mental notes, uh, it seems to me the ones I jot down on paper, I usually have a better, uh, a better uh, out or, uh, results in retaining those notes if I write them on paper and not just trust my mind. But at any rate, Matthew chapter 19 and Mark chapter 10. When you look at the harmony of the Gospels, and you see in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, we, we see a fuller story here. Because in looking at Matthew and looking at Mark as well, we find out that, and by the way, this is not a parable. The last two Sundays we've been looking at parables. But in this true story, this, this real individual running up to Jesus and asking this most, in, most important question, this was a real person at a real time asking Jesus one of the most important questions ever. This is not a parable. We need to understand that. And who is this individual? Well, just from God's word, it says a certain ruler, he's not named. Again, when you look at the Matthew and you look at Mark, we find out that he is young. He's a young ruler. We also find out that he's very rich. So, you've got a young, rich 
ruler. Seems like he's got quite a bit going for himself, doesn't it? What else do we see about him? Well, in just reading through this story, we see that he's very religious. And I would think that at least externally, he looks and appears to be very moral, right? Those are good traits. But if one is relying on those things, they can be very dangerous. Because then it's like the parables that we looked at, especially last week. It feeds into this matter of self-confidence and self-trust. It, it, it feeds into this matter of, I'm a good person, I'm righteous. It does feed into that. Well, this individual, and, and Mark helps paint the picture in Mark chapter 10. And this is coming off of Jesus, and we can look at it from Luke's gospel since you have it right there in front of you, right? Uh, Jesus, the little children come to him after the apostles said, oh, no, don't let them bother him. And Jesus said, no, no, you let them come. For such is the kingdom of God in verse 17 of Luke 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Then Jesus is back on the road again, Mark chapter 10 tells us. And the rich young ruler, he heard that, so we believe. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He goes running. He goes running up to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. This is what we read. He goes running up to Jesus. And not only does he go running up to Jesus, but it says in verse 17 of Mark 10, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him. How many of you are getting this picture? Here's a young guy who, who it appears on the outside looking in that he has everything. And this shows you that, that riches, that religion, and that morals, and let's even take it further. Uh, he looks successful in the eyes of man. He's a person of prominence. He's a person of authority. So if it looks like there's a guy who has it together, this is the guy. There's something, un there's something unsettled within him, though. People say about the God-sized heart in our souls. This man thought he understood what eternal life was. He thought he was headed there, but he wasn't 100% sure. And maybe you're sitting here today or watching through this, and you're not 100% sure. I believe he sincerely sought Jesus out. I believe he was very serious in that. He was very respectful for Jesus, but he was a little over the top with the respect thing. He runs to Jesus, he kneels down, and he says, Good teacher. You see, he heard Jesus speaking about, the, about eternal life, eternal life. Jesus, his main topic was the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. I better be sure of heaven. I better be sure that I'm going to, to obtain eternal life, that I'm going to have eternal life, that there is. And so this shows you, too, that he had an understanding that there is life yet to come. This is not all of it. It doesn't end when I close my eyes in death. He had that understanding. Do you have that understanding? Some just want to write off heaven and hell and eternity, just write it off. I don't believe that, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. It's thinking. In fact, he, he doesn't only think that, he, he says these things. He says in verse 21, and he said, all these things I've kept from my youth, done this. Paul said the same thing, didn't he? As far as adherence to the law, buddy, right on. As far as zeal, nobody outdid me. He had all these credentials, Paul said, and then I read from there a little earlier from Philippians 3, he counted them all but refuge, dung, nothing, means nothing. This guy wasn't at that place yet. This guy saw these things 
these, this, this matter of being religious, this matter of being moral, this matter of, of, of adhering to the law, at least externally it looks like that, as having his bases covered. I am good to go. No, you're not. No, in reality, you are not good to go. In fact, you're deceived. You're deceived in all your thinking that you are good to go. But, in order to reveal this to you, I'm going to take you to the Word of God. That's what Jesus did. That's why our evangelism should take people to the Word of God. It really should. Do you realize how many people, if an inquiry was made like this, and of course not to Jesus, but came up to this and says, you know, my God's, I believe God's really stirring my heart. There's just something I'm unsettled here about this. What, what must I do to obtain eternal life? It would have been done in two minutes. Here, get down on your knees here. Oh, you can't get down? That's fine. Just bow your head. Pray this prayer with me. And never walking them through the scriptures and showing them the bad news first. Do you believe you have sinned? Yeah. In, in what ways? What can you do about those sins? Nothing. You can't take something unpure and make it pure. Job said that. You can't take something unclean and, automat- and, and make it clean. No man can do that. So he, he walked him through it. And the second tablet of the law of the Decalogue of the commandment, and he's dealing with fellow man. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Do these things. Yep, I've done these things. Next, next slide, please, Eric. He said, I've, I, all these things have kept. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to them, and I love Mark's account. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. <laughs> he loved him. The same Jesus who would weep over Jerusalem. Why? Because he created us. Because he loves us. Because he's not willing that any should perish. Here's an inquiry being made. And this guy, he he doesn't have what he thinks he has. (laughs) And compassion is reaching out. Jesus looks at him with love and compassion. And really with pity. Which is compassion. He didn't say, you're good to go then. Which shows us, keeping the law will not save you. Why? Because nobody can keep the law perfectly. One has, Jesus. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And he did. Completely. But none of us can. None of us can. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. He's blind. He's blind. This young man who, who seems to have it all together, a bag of chips and everything, all that saying, he doesn't. Everything in a bag of chips. I think that's how it goes. Thank you. It wasn't in the notes. No reason for it to have been. Uh, but we laugh at things like that. But how many people are walking together thinking they have it all together? I've got enough righteousness. I've got enough righteousness. I've got enough righteousness. My friend, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have righteousness. It's that simple. And you've been deceived. And again, this is like last week. If, if at the end of the day, well, at the end of life, <laughs> you are counting on your goods outweighing your bads, That's a fatal mistake. No, you're not. And so Jesus lovingly, when he heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. And Matthew's account says, uh, which commandment? Okay, okay, I, I did all that. Is there any others? In fact, Matthew's account adds in 
and love your neighbor as yourself. Which should have hit a note. Because the two greatest commandments, Jesus summarizes the law and the prophets with, you shall love the Lord your God, all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, right? And your neighbor as yourself. And this man had not. In fact, this really truly reveals, and I'm getting ahead of the story, so I'll stop. Jesus gives this individual. Now, is this for everybody then? So here's the only way to get to heaven. And in fact, we have collection plates back there. Just, just dump it all in before you walk out the door. No, no. Did Jesus ask his apostles, come follow me? Yes. They left fishing boats and nets and parents and family. And they left them behind. That was then, then and there. And the here and now, he calls us to forsake all. But that doesn't mean we sell everything and we live in a, in a uh, commune or something. No. But he does call us to be willing to forsake everything. To hold everything with an open hand. It's yours. I'm a steward. I'm a manager. I'm one you have entrusted with this, and it's all yours. And when you say, I want that, it's yours anyhow. See, we need to be sold out within. That we, as far as we are concerned, we are sold out to Jesus. And we, this life we now live in our flesh, we live, for the, we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Uh, the blank check of my life has been signed and handed over to you, Jesus. That's what he calls us to do. It doesn't mean we sell every personal thing off, give it all to the church, and then what? Live off the other people? No. But it does mean to be sold out to Christ. Jesus says, what does a prophet man? Should he gain the whole world in the end, lose his own soul? You want to keep hanging on, hanging on? No, the child of God. And let me ask you this. Has your faith made it to your finances? In other words, we talk about faith, talk about faith. But real faith will enter every part of our being and our doing. It will permeate us. And so for some people, they're hanging on to one thing. Maybe it's control. Maybe it's reputation. Maybe it's a person in your life. This man, it was his riches, which caused him to break the first commandment. And that is to have no other gods before him. His money was his God. Let's, let's, go, let's, let's go to the next scriptures. But when he heard this, how many still see in the young fella running up? He wouldn't have been out of breath. He was young. He was rich, Right? He falls before Jesus. Good teacher, what good thing can I do? I'm sincere. I'm serious. You keep talking about the kingdom of God and eternal life, and I want to know, I want to know that I have it. Only God's good, buddy, not you. You know the commandments, I kept them. Oh yeah, you've kept them. Well, let me probe deep into your heart now. I want you, Mr. Rich, young ruler, who have kept all the commandments, I want you to just sell it all off. I want you to part with it right now, right here today. And not only part with it, but give it away. Give it to the poor. Love your neighbor as yourself, buddy. And then come and follow me. Make me first. Make God first, not your money. Wow. When he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. You see, when the call of God comes upon our lives, we're brought to a crossroads. We're 
brought to a place of decision. This man was brought to that crossroads. He was brought to that decision. And Jesus saw it. And some said, buddy, hey, Jesus, back off a little bit. Lower the bar. You got him right there. He's eating out of your hand. Just give him a pat on the back. Tell him to love Jesus and everything will be cool. Did Jesus do that? No. Jesus, do you know you missed an opportunity here? <laughs> of supreme obedience. This is what I call for. Well, you want to you know what you got to do? You got to make me first. You got to let go of what you're hanging on to and considering as righteous. Let go of all that, forsake all of that, and come to me for righteousness. That's what you got to do. That's why I did entitle it whatever I entitled it. The weightiness of eternal life. So here it is, young man. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's so sad when people hold on to the temporal, the here and now and the temporal. I love where it talks about in Hebrews where, where Moses did not do that. He, he forsook the pleasures of, uh, of, of this life, this temporal life. He, he saw that Christ and, 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 and the kingdom of God was of most importance, and he, he let go. He let, he let go of the riches in Egypt, and, and he clung to Christ. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you let go of, 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 of the security of, of what, which is insecurity, of this life? Whatever means that is, your, your health, your strength, your riches, your relationships, whatever. You know, when you look at this title, the rich young ruler, we think, well, I'm not rich. I'm definitely not young. I'm not a ruler. This does not apply to me. Friends, this applies to all of us. It brings us to that place of decision. What am I trusting in? Who am I trusting in? Who am I trusting in? And so when you're brought to that understanding, look, the only one that's good and the only one that's right is Christ. That's why he came. That we forsake, let go of what we're holding on to that makes us right makes us acceptable, that tips the scale in our favor, that my good outweighs my bad. Huh. You need to let go of that. This guy wasn't willing to let go of that. People can speculate till they're blue in the face. I don't care what we see in scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the guy walks away. Sorrowful. Because he had many riches. And we don't read where Jesus ran after him. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, no, no. He laid it out. This is the way it is. This is the way it is. What does Jesus say? Well, and when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he says how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. He's not saying it's impossible, but how hard it is. Money becomes such a vice. Riches become such a vice. It's not the love of money, or it is not money that is the root of all evil. It is the love of money, where you love it supremely, when your riches is what is most important to you, or your health, or your uh, uh, prominence, whatever. Yours, yours, yours. If you're holding on to anything that is yours, for righteousness and for security... You have a faulty righteousness, and you have no security. It's just truth. Well, we need to move on with this. Go ahead, Eric. And those who heard it. So here's another great question. I mean, can you picture the, the 12 and, and other disciples? Because remember, a throne just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. So the people, they're just astonished. Well, what did he just say? And the 12 bumping each other. What did he just say? And so, of course, one stands out. Who then can be saved? 
That's another great question we find in this passage. I wonder how many people, even here today, are holding on to their own righteousness. That their confidence and trust is, as long as my good outweighs my bad. Or even this. I believe in God. I believe in God. Belief in God is not enough. How is true belief seen? How is true faith seen? How is it depicted in Scripture? Obedience. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And his commandments are not burdensome. There will be, by the Spirit of God, a desire to love God in return and to obey his word. Will we get it right all the time? No. Because there's no one who doesn't sin. But the fact is now, the righteousness of Christ is ours, who, all who put their faith and trust in Him. What makes me right? What makes you right? If we're trusting in Christ. And how is trusting in Christ, how is it seen? Well, it, it, it's evident by the fact that you love God, and nobody loves Him supremely, because we're all messed up. Some more than others. Nobody plays with a full deck. Some have exchanged a couple of the cards for jokers. I don't know. But I'm just saying. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And until we come to Christ and cling to Christ, we have no righteousness. None. So when he asks the question, who then can be saved? You know, I see this very similar to, to uh, Nicodemus. And I didn't read any commentary that said that or heard any preaching that said that, so maybe I'm way out on this lonely limb. But the similarities is this. Here's a teacher of Israel coming to Jesus and saying, hey, you must be from God. He, he's, is he buttering him up? Again, Jesus cuts to the chase and says, look, buddy, Mr. Teacher of Israel, Unless you're born again, spiritually speaking, you, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. So then who can be saved? Those who have been born of God. When the Philippian jailer viewed Paul and Silas beaten, almost dead, singing praises and singing praises to God instead of licking their wounds and crying, they're praising God at midnight. When the Philippian jailer saw that in the miraculous work of this earthquake, he said, what must I do to be saved? Uh, when, when those heard Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, they were cut to the heart. They said, what must we do? And so, one asks, who then can be saved? Praise God, he brings us to that place of asking that question. The same question that the rich young ruler asked Jesus, how can I have eternal life? I want to be sure of heaven. Well, quit trusting in yourself. Let go of self. Get rid of all that stuff. Come follow me. No, no I won't do that. I remember praying in a man's ear, Clear up till he took his last breath over and hide in the trailer court there years and years ago. Man, you got to come to Jesus. No, no, no. Wow, wow. And I know that it's only God who, who, who opens the blinded eyes and softens the hardened heart. I know that it's God, that he's the author of salvation. He calls and draws. I, I, I get that. Um, and it's only by his grace we're saved. Here's the thing. Here, here's the hope. Look at this. Who then can be saved? But he said the things, Jesus said, the things which are impossible with men. Salvation is impossible for you and I. But with God, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. All things are possible. So we cry out to God, please save so-and-so. Please save so-and-so. Go ahead, Aaron. Now I have to wrap this up quickly. So he said to them, Surely I say to you, there is no one. And as far as the, the camel going through the eye of the needle, there was speculation that there was this gate and they would get the camel to bow to, or to kneel down and get underneath this cable. 
And, and most scholars say, no, that's nonsense. That's not even what Jesus was talking about. What Jesus was talking about, the eye, the camel going through the eye of the needle, is the impossibility for man to save himself. If you want to believe that other story, that's up to you. Jesus was just speaking. I, uh, he, w- he was speaking in exaggeration, hy- hyperbolic, hyperbolic, hyperboles, whatever. Thank you. The only reason that threw me off is because I heard it pronounced different the other day. He was talking in exaggeration. He was driving home the point. This is why I don't use big words, by the way. He was driving home the point. Man cannot save himself. It's impossible. But could a camel go through the eye of a needle? If God wanted it to, it could. Okay? So he said to them, and I close with this, Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time. <laughs> Have you been a recipient of that? Now, he was talking to those who had, who had forsaken him. I mean, they did. Again, boats, nets, parents, walking with Jesus now for three years, or almost. But, but this does apply to all in a sense. That when we let go of the world and and cling to Jesus and his kingdom, we don't lose anything. Do you realize that? We don't lose anything. And are you going to even try to compare temporal riches, things that are going to be burnt up, things that are just dust in the the future will be just dust? Compare any of those things to eternal blessings? There's no comparison. I have brothers and sisters in Christ. I have, I have a family of God. I, I have his fruit living within. There is contentment. There is satisfaction. There is joy. All those things. I've received so much more in, in, in letting go of life as I knew it. And now as a child of God, being blessed with his goodness. And Jesus is saying, who shall not receive many times more in this present time, in the age to come, eternal life. Which again tells us that eternal life is two-part. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing Jesus. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I've written to you that you may know that you have life. That's why he wrote these things. Let's stand we'll be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, I know a lot has been said, and, and uh, I just pray that you would, uh, that your spirit would continue to take your word and run it through our hearts and our minds and do business with it, dear Father. Do business. If people have not come to that point of decision, Father, the, the, the crossroads of, of, of what are you going to do with this now? If they haven't yet, Lord, I, I pray they will before this day is over. Uh, or the days ahead, that, that you will show them it's not riches, it's not prestige, it's not the good outweighing the bad. No, 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 it's forsaking all those things and trusting in Christ, the only true God, the only one who is truly good. to desire His goodness and to cling to Him and experiencing in part uh, eternal life now, uh, which You have given us Your Spirit as an earnest, as a, a pledge, as a promise until we're forever with You. So lead people out of darkness and into the light of Christ and into His kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Father, your word tells us that we're to be imitators of Christ. And Jesus says that uh, servant isn't above his master. And so, Father, help us. Help us, those of us who have answered the call, have heard the call to forsake the things of this world that we're holding on to and to flee to you and cling to you, to your son Jesus. Help us to live with that mindset of not our will, but your will be done. That 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 distinction has been made that there is our will and there is your will. And that throughout each day we we're faced with those decisions of, of what to do. But again, those of us who have come to know you, we've we we want to do your will. Help us to do just that. And for those who are still still holding on to anything else but but your son Christ, Lord, help them to let go and, and to come running and, and to cry out and to cling to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless.